It's great to be back at the, uh, at the Gerald Ford Museum and Library. I've uh, been to the one in Grand Rapids a couple times, and it's great to be here and actually get a chance to see President Ford's um, library, kind of one of those homes away from home. So I really appreciate it, his office at least. So I'm here to um, do a little program for you called uh, Songs That Heal the Nation. Now, when I was a kid growing up in Detroit, my grandmother brought home a record. Now, young people, the record is that big <laughs> compact disc that you can actually see going around and around, right? And uh, she brought home this, this uh, record. was country blues, which is different from urban blues. It's different from B.B. King, you know. Thrill is gone. Thrill is gone away. No, this was the kind of blues you played when you're too cheap to get a band. And uh, a guy was lamenting his, his woman leaving him, but he couldn't do anything about it. Well, my baby and me, we never used to fight. Used to love, hug, and kiss at night. I came home one morning and she had gone away. Ever since, ever since she went away, Lord, no, my heart does nothing but it. Her address is unknown, Lord, no blues is here to stay. She gone but not forgotten, tell you the reason why. She had the kind of loving, love that would satisfy. She had love like the ocean rolling that comes in with the tide. Well, I hope, love, I hope that comes a day. She let her love roll by my way and explain to me herself the reason why she left. So I fell in love with that music, right? Thank you. And, uh, I started to, to study it and ask a simple question, like where did that music come from? Well, that blues music came out of the spiritual, came out of America's um, original music, what happened when African music met European music in the Deep South. And when folks came over on a ship like the Mayflower, they brought their music with them, they brought their scale, they brought... <laughs> But when folks came over on a ship like the Amistad from West Africa, they brought their scale. And the difference between that seven note scale and that five note scale is what made American music American. Because in one church you're hearing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You're standing in front of the white Methodist church. The reason you know it's a Methodist church is because they've been singing the same song for 150 years, but they still keep looking at the text. <laughs> and the reason you know it's a white church is because of the way the music sounds. It lands right on the beat. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's not a lot of gymnastics going on in that church. But go 500 feet down the road and maybe you hear music coming out of a barn or a stable or a stand of trees. Well, that's where you have those folks who were enslaved in 1840, and they're singing the same songs, they're listening to the same preachers, they're interpreting the same text, but somehow it comes out different. Ooh, amazing grace, That said a like me. I once was lost, 
But now, thank God I'm found Was blind, but now I see, oh Lord, I see. And the difference, thank you, between those two versions is what creates American music, because there's always that tension. But those songs did more than just become vehicles for worship. Those songs healed. Those songs allowed us to get past some of our most difficult times. And because we were always listening to each other, always borrowing from each other, it sort of flavored the sound of American music. Nobody had a guitar like this one back in the 1840s. In fact, this guitar has a story attached to it. You'll notice it has pinstripes, right? It has a streak that comes from the bottom up through the sound hole. Almost looks like a stained glass window from a church. Well, the thing that's always fascinated me about American music is it has a story. Here's the story of this guitar. This old house was built on Trumbull Street back in 1910 when the whole world worked for Henry Ford. He was the poor man's friend. Detroit money built it, but it outlived the fame of that city that put the world on wheels and gave Motown its name. When you come from Detroit, you have to know, my friend, you cannot surrender. And you cannot give in And even when you're broken And you're almost at the end Know that if you save the pieces You will rise again Milton Smith, he lived in this old house For almost 60 years And he'd had his share of singing And it had his share of tears Through the Coolies and Hernandezes Time would take its toll. 2012, they tore it down, 102 years old. But when you come from Detroit, you have to know, my friend, that you cannot surrender. Lord, and you dare not give in. And even when you're broken and you're almost at the end, know that if you save the pieces, you will live again. I'm just a Detroit storyteller, but I travel near and far, and a Detroit storyteller wants to play a Detroit guitar. So I met a builder named Zim Nicky, a man of awesome skills. Arch tops, flat tops, ukuleles, ain't nothing he can't build. Say, I got something I want to show you, and I think it's kind of sweet. See, I built this from this old house that used to stand on Trumbull Street. I used maple from the floorboards and walnut from the shelf. And the top is from a ceiling joist that I couldn't clean myself. Now I play a Detroit guitar made of hundred year old wood. And I got to tell you, she sings mighty good. Cause when you come from Detroit, you have to know my friend. You cannot surrender, Lord, and you dare not give in. And even when you're broken and you're almost at the end, know that if you save the pieces, you will sing again. Know that if you save the pieces, you will sing again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have lots of nice instruments, but this guitar is sort of a metaphor for what I'm talking about. This house used to be, or this guitar used to be a house that stood on Trumbull Street, right? Ironically, the Tigers used to play on Trumbull Street. <laughs> but the reason it has pinstripes is because these are floorboards from that old house, right? And the top is from a ceiling joist. And the year 1910 is embedded in the 12th fret, and a picture of the house is embedded in the headstock. So no matter where I play in this country or in this world, 
if I play this guitar, I'm playing Detroit. And the idea is that you never throw something away, right? You never give up on it. And so that whole idea has informed my musical career. When I go back and I find an old song, I ask myself, you know, what was it built around? And how can we preserve the spirit of that song in that house? So I met a man years ago by the name of Mike Seeger, it's Pete's little brother. And he was playing weird instruments like this. This is a uh, gourd banjo. And when folks came over on those slave ships, they could not bring their instruments, but they could bring the idea for the instrument. They found that there were gourds in the United States, just like the gourds they had left in West Africa. And they found that if they took a flat neck and put it through that gourd and then stretched gut strings across it, that you could produce an instrument that could play melody and rhythm. Now, early musicologists said that the music of those early African Americans was sad, lonesome. Not surprising. They were in a new land and knew that they wouldn't see the land of their birth again. They sing songs like, mm, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone a long way from home. Oh, true believer. Oh, true believer. Oh, true believer. A long that music didn't stay sad. Those early Africans found out that if they listened to the words that were read to them and preached to them in that Bible, there was an avenue, a way of escape. So they took that music and they used it as a tool, a tool of escape and a tool of resilience. And pretty soon, they started doing songs like Wade in the Water. So, I want you to imagine that you're working on this plantation, and I'm teaching you this song. I sing, Wade in the Water. You sing, Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water, children. Wade in the Water, children. Wade in the water, wade in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Yeah. So that's the chorus. While we're working, doing whatever task we do, the folks on the plantation like the fact that the indentured servants are singing. They can't be up to anything if they're singing, after all. So we sing, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, look over yonder, all dressed in white. God's gonna trouble the water. Look like the children of the Israelites. God's gonna trouble the water. 
Oh, look over yonder, all dressed in red. God's gonna trouble the water. Look like the children that Moses led. God's gonna trouble the water. Everybody wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Didn't Moses take them by the hand? God's gonna trouble the water. He led those children in the Canaan land. God's gonna trouble the water. Jordan River is deep and cold. God's gonna trouble the water. Well, it chill my body, but not my soul. God's gonna trouble the one more time. Wait in the water, oh, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water, yeah, God's gonna trouble the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Ah, thank you. Now, what is that song about? Well, imagine that you wanted to get from one of those slave states to one of those free states, to one of those places like Michigan or Ohio, where you could keep the fruit of your labor. You wouldn't have to worry about your children being born into slavery and being sold away from you. And you were willing to make that courageous journey, but in order to get into the north, you had to cross a mighty river called the Ohio. And you had never traveled on your own. So somebody starts singing that song on that plantation and you start to pick up on these Bible images. God's going to trouble the water. God is going to what make a way either part the Red Sea or create the troubled water to heal that thing, that sickness that you have. And so as you were talking about the Jordan River, you didn't want to get to the Middle East to cross the Jordan. You wanted to get to Cincinnati to cross the Ohio. And, uh, you know, not only did you want to get, you did not want to get to Canaan, but you wanted to get to Canada. And so you hid those ambitions inside that song. And, and uh, you know, even there were folks who would help you, the angels who would come to give you a hand, the conductors along the Underground Railroad. And all of those things are embedded in those old spirituals, those coded spirituals like, um, swing low sweet chariot or steal the way home. I ain't got long to stay here. So that's one of the things, one of the ways that songs could heal a nation. The songs could become uh, emblematic of power. As I met Mike Seeger over 25 years ago and he was playing this stuff, he was also playing the fiddle. And I had had an encounter with the violin when I was little. Uh, I loved the violin. I had a little red violin. It was shiny and it was beautiful. And, and I practiced Mary Had a Little Lamb for the whole year. And then I went on vacation and I came back and the teacher gave me this rusty, ugly brown violin. And I said, I am not going to touch it again. Well, I did not touch it again until I met Mike Seeger. <laughs> but now I have a rusty old fiddle that I love, right? This old fiddle is uh, made in 1818. So it's been around for a little while, right? But what Mike did that I had never heard before is to take the harmonica and combine it with the fiddle, which gives you this mournful, real, really weird American Appalachian sound. And the song comes from a woman by the name of Addie Graham. Miss Graham was a, a white Kentucky uh, woman who heard a lot of music as it passed by her farm. She didn't play any instruments. So Mike took one of her songs and put it on the fiddle and on a harmonica. And the song's called, We're Stole and Sold from Africa. But strangely enough, the belief is that this was a white abolitionist hymn. Since black folks had to disguise the real meaning of their songs, white abolitionists didn't have to, and they could sing openly about their disgust for this thing called slavery. We're stolen, 
soul from Africa Transported to America Like hogs and sheep We're so in droves Could bear the last and endure the cold See how they take us from our wives Small children from their mother's side They take us to some foreign land Make slaves to wait on gentlemen We're almost naked, as you see, and most barefooted here we be. Exposed to snow, but wind and rain, to bear the last and endure the pain. Lord, have mercy and look down upon the plight of the African on being in need for out our greed. We pray to God for some relief. Thank you. Thank you. So literally for decades, the sound of American music was the sound of the fiddle or the banjo. But as we got closer to the 20th century, we discovered that this guitar, this thing borrowed from Italian music, made the perfect American instrument. And here's a song written by Bob Gibson not Bob Gibson, the pitcher for the Cardinals, <laughs> but Bob Gibson, the great folk singer, who tells this true story in song. See, I love songs that tell you things that we didn't know. Now, we talk about the songs that heal the nation. Sometimes the songs that heal the nation are the most unlikely songs that you can imagine. In fact, this song starts off with a song or a phrase of 10 notes that divided this nation. Huh. How could this song be included in this program? The news was won from Richmond in the fading April sun that Lee had given Grant his sword, alas, the war was won. Into the streets the people spilled, feeling their excitement build. Crowds around the White House mill, asking, is it true it's finally done? Mr. Lincoln in the White House heard them calling out his name. He sat there wondering what to say to ease their years of pain. Someone yelled, come out the door. Tell us what you have in store for the rebels who have lost the war. So I don't pull the porch, Abe Lincoln came. Say we are gathered not in anger, but in celebration. Grateful we are once again a single nation. Let us stand here reassured, now that peace has been secured, our nation's illness can be cured. I suggest the overture for this occasion. He said, let the band play Dixie. That tune that holds the head up high and proud And let our nation once divided, blooded, but unbound 
take the swords of war and beat them back into a plow. On the day that Lee surrendered, Mr. Lincoln told the crowd to let the band play Dixie. A tired Union soldier hobbled on his only limb, filled with bitter memories the war had left with him. On his wooden leg and cane, his face was set and creased with pain. He stumbled, fell, and rose again, wondering what the future held for him. He spied a black child kneeling there in humble gratitude. He knelt down right beside her to join her thankful mood. Grateful words were raised in prayer God, in your sweet loving care, our broken nation, please repair and let our wounded lives now be renewed. Said, let the band play Dixie, that tune that holds his head up high in pride, and let our nation once divided, blooded, but unbowed. Take the swords of war and beat them back into a plow. On the day that Lee surrendered, Mr. Lincoln told the cry to let the band play Dixie. Let the band play Dixie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, that is a sign of a statesman, right? One who decides that it is more important to bring us together than to fight about the differences that we have with one another. And coming throughout American history, we've had these instances where we found ourselves wounded or hurt or divided. But somehow music has always sort of been a vehicle that allowed us to realize that we have way more in common than we do to fight about. When I started to really delve into the blues, I started to realize that the blues are the trunk of the great tree of American music. What do I mean by that? It's like the spiritual, that's where the roots are, right? White spirituals and black spirituals. But then eventually, as we got closer to the 20th century, we started to get into this thing called the blues, a really simple form of music, often based on one, two, or three chords, and using five notes. And there's a guy who's buried in Detroit, his name is Sun House, Eddie James House Jr., who composed something almost 100 years ago called the Death Letter Blues. What happens? There is nothing more wounding, I suppose, than death, right? So a man gets a letter bordered in black that tells him the woman he loves is dead. And he comes up with this song using three chords and five notes. I got a letter this morning. How you think it read? Said, hurry, hurry, cause the girl you love is dead. Got a letter this morning. Oh Lord, how you think it read? Said, hurry, hurry, cause the gal you love is dead. You know I packed up my suitcase, took off down the road. When I got there, she was laying on the cooling board. You know I packed my suitcase and I took off down the road. You know when I got that love, she was laying on a cooling bowl. Well, that song can go on for a really long time because it's long and depressing, as is the nature of Delta Blues. But that music didn't stop in Mississippi, continued to move up the Mississippi River and up Highway 61 to places like Chicago and Memphis and Detroit and New York and piano players got a hold of those five notes and those three chords. On one hand, they played. On the other, they played the 
three chords. One hand me down my jumper, won't shine my overalls. Won't you hand me down my jumper, won't shine my overalls. Well, I'm about to catch a train, what they call a cannonball. Oh, that was hot stuff in the 20s. So hot as a matter of fact, white musicians fell in love with the blues. And one in particular by the name of Jimmy Rogers slowed the blues down. And then he added one thing that had never been a part of the blues before Jimmy, but it forever changed the face of American music. He went. I got a team for Texas, team for Tennessee. I got a team for Texas, team for Tennessee. Got a team for Thelma, the girl who made a wreck out of me. You're the lady, oh, you're the lady, oh, you're the lady. Now you discover two things this evening. First, that country music comes out of blues music. And the second thing you discovered is that black people can yodel. <laughs> and when you think about it, you listen to blues and you have some certain characteristics of blues. And Muddy Waters would say, Well, I wish I was a catfish Swimming in a hole deep blue sea I'd have all you good-looking women fishing out of me, showing up after me. And if another guy did that song out of Nashville, it might sound like, Well, I wish I was a catfish swimming in the deep blue sea. I'd have all you good-looking women trying to set a hook for me. Thank you, my name's Johnny, right? So you understand that music. We found ourselves sharing that music in common, but it didn't end there. You imagine coming out of the Great Depression. Well, a lot of those boogie-woogie piano players showed up in churches, both black and white, looking for work. And all of a sudden, church music started sounding a lot like boogie-woogie. They didn't call it church boogie-woogie called it gospel. Well, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, Lord, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You know that song? Help me sing it. Well, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, Lord, I'm gonna let it, oh, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Same three chords, same five notes. But it doesn't end there. Can you imagine, in about 1935, out of Kentucky, you have a young man by the name of Bill Monroe, and he decides to invent a new style of country called bluegrass. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most un-Negro kind of musics you can imagine. Five white guys standing around wearing cowboy hats and periodically hollering, yeehaw! Not exactly my ideal world music, but there is blues in bluegrass, in part because Mr. Monroe had a black teacher by the name of Arnold Schultz, who never recorded, and in large part because he had a guitar player with a lot of soul by the name of Mr. Lester Flat. At the end of those bluegrass runs, Lester Flat played something called the G run. Like that. Now you can't play bluegrass without it. But that is just the boogie woogie. Played on a flat pick. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Lord, I'm going down the road feeling bad. I'm going down the road feeling bad, Lord, Lord, and I ain't going to be treated this way. Yeah. Same three chords, 
same five notes. You get an idea? We're starting to understand how come American music is shared and sometimes stolen. But that's not the end of it. Can you imagine it's about 1948? You get a young man by the name of Ray Charles, not to be confused with Jamie Foxx. And Ray Charles has a band and Ray has been playing gospel his whole life, but Ray decides to make some money, so everywhere he used to say Jesus, Ray says baby. And it works out great until one night they run out of songs. And Ray says to the band, that's all right, baby, just sing back to me what I sing to you. So you guys are in the band. Sing back to me what I sing to you. Are you ready? Yeah. I say, are you ready? Yeah. Say, A, hey. hey. O, oh. Hey, oh, hey, hey, oh, tell me what I say, 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 tell me what I say. Let's do it again. I, uh, 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 tell me what I say, 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 tell me what I say. I say those are the same three chords in the same five notes. Now we call it R&B, but it doesn't end there. Imagine it's 1955 and you have a television, a gigantic wooden box in the middle of your living room with a little tiny screen. And it only gets three stations. Young people, do not panic. There's nothing wrong with your cable. There is no cable. And those three stations only come in if your little brother is hanging on to the antenna. <laughs> and so the most popular show in America on Sunday night on CBS, you got it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our great show for you tonight. You're gonna like this young man. He comes to us from Tupelo, Mississippi. By way of Memphis, Tennessee, he uses three chords and five notes, ladies and gentlemen. And when Ed Sullivan sticks his arm out, the kid goes, one for the money, two for the show, three to get it ready, and I'll go, can't go, but don't you mess with my blue suede shoe. You can do anything, so my blue suede shoe, yeah. Blue, blue, blue suede shoes, blue, blue, blue suede shoes. Blue, blue, blue suede shoes. Blue, blue, blue suede. You can do in a fine say of my blue suede shoe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo. Thank you. You know they're filming this. I hope they only got me from the waist up. But <laughs> now think about this. The impact that musicians like Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry had on the segregated South. You go down to places like Nashville and, and Memphis and folks were concerned because black kids were listening to white music and white kids were listening to black music. But those black kids didn't care and the white kids didn't care. There were black kids who wanted to be Elvis and white kids who wanted to be Chuck Berry. And then there were kids who wanted to be Liberace and Little Richard, but that's a different story. <laughs> but as those kids were listening to that music, they were breaking down barriers that Dr. King was marching against laws, but these kids were twisting against customs, right? So by the time five good-looking black kids from Detroit toured in the Deep South, oh yeah, I didn't give you Chuck Berry, did I? Chuck Berry is the black king. When I go into little elementary schools, they go, there's a black king? Yeah, yeah, it's a black, and lots of black kings. But one king in particular, I'm thinking about Chuck Berry, right? Who took that lick from Bill Monroe. I am a man of constant sorrow, trouble I had all of my days. But he didn't do it like that. He did it like this. Way down in Louisiana, down in New Orleans, back up in the woods, I'm on the evergreen. Stood in old cabin, made of earth and wood, where well, a little, little boy named Johnny be good. Little boy could never read or write so well. He could play the guitar, just like the ring in a bell. Say, go, go, Johnny, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go, go. Yeah, Johnny, 
gonna be good. Thank you. Same three chords in the same five notes. So that music paved the way for those five good looking black kids from Detroit who would tour in the deep and segregated South, go to Mississippi. And there's a dance, but there's a rope down the middle of the gymnasium to keep the black kids on one side and the white kids on the other side. But when those kids heard those five notes out of Detroit, they got so excited that the kids themselves tore the rope down. Didn't matter what mama said, what daddy said, because they were dancing too. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day When it's cold outside I've got the month of May Help me sing it I guess you say What can make me feel this way My girl Talking about my girl, my girl. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right. So, in its own way, thank you. In its own way, rock and roll and Motown helped to heal the nation. But then we are so far removed from where our music comes from now because it's so corporate. It's so. It's so flashy, there are wardrobe malfunctions and explosions on the stage. But think about it. If you go back to that original Death Letter Blues, that long, depressing song from Mississippi, what would happen if that song was recorded not in 1928, but in 2024? Chances are Sun House would change it up a little bit. Instead of doing each verse twice, he might do each verse once. He might speed up the tempo of the song making it more percussive. In fact, he might even fade the music out, in which case the 1928 Death Letter Blues starts to sound like the 2024 remix. <laughs> I got a letter this morning, how do you think it read? Said, hurry, hurry, cause the gal you love is dead. I packed up my suitcase, Took off down the road. When I got there, she was laying out on the cooling board. I eat the post and I look down in her face and say, Hey, you know I love you, but I just can't take your place. It seemed like the thousand was standing around the funeral ground. I didn't know how much I love that kid. They put my baby in the ground for my arms. And then I walk away and say, Hey, you know I love you. Have to see you judgment day. You know I woke up this morning. It was about the break of day. I was hugging on a pillow where my baby used to lay. You know, went to church, bowed down. I tried to pray, but the blues come along and they blow my spirit away. Woke up this morning about the break of day and I was hugging on a pillow where my baby used to lay. I say, Hush. I thought I heard her call my name. She didn't call so loud, but she called so plain. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that is the insidious work that I love to do in schools. But, you know, sometimes we seem like we remain divided for no reason. Part of the tradition of this music is to be able to create within that tradition. So when I was um, invited to the National Storytelling Festival in 2009, I met this beautiful little Alabama woman by the name of Miss Catherine Wyndham. And Miss Catherine was the queen of storytellers. She was from um, Selma. My grandmother, was from Evergreen, two places in Alabama. Now, the only thing that I remembered growing up, watching the news with Walter Cronkite about Selma, is seeing Dr. King trying to cross the Pettus Bridge, and seeing Bull Connor and his, and his horses and his, and his dogs knock down protesters. But then, Miss Catherine 
told a very different Selma. Just like my grandmother told a very different Evergreen, Connecticut County, Alabama. When Miss, when Miss Catherine would finish one of those stories about growing up in Alabama, she'd say, these are your family stories. And if you don't keep them alive, wouldn't that be a shame? Wouldn't that be a pity? They'd be lost. And so I ran home from the National Storytelling Festival and wrote this song based on what my grandmother had told me took place in Conecuh County. My great-grandfather's name was Will Cunningham. That's the title of this story and this song. Conecuh County, Alabama, 1925. Will Cunningham rode into town to get his week's supplies. Now Will was a black man who'd fought in World War I and he'd faced the smoke and powder, but he never chose to run. He had a favorite scripture whenever times got mean. It was 2 Kings chapter 6, around verse 17. It had helped him back in France when he was far from home. Saying, Lord, open up our eyes to see we do not stand alone. But he never picked his battles and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him and chariots on the wind. And those who stood with him were more than those who rode with them. Now, Will was my great-grandfather, and he never learned to bow. When other black men would step aside, Will never figured how. He worked for boss Mac Binion, who was a hard and wealthy man, because everywhere you were standing, you were on Mac Binion's land. Mac Binion was a white man, but all white men ain't the same, and some would curse you and abuse you, and they'd call you out your name. That's the kind Will met that morning when he stepped into the store just a ball of hate and evil and very little more. But he did not pick his battles and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him and chariots on the wind. And those who stood with him were more than those who rode with them. Now when Will Cunningham met evil, he looked evil in the face. Evil says, this is the kind of nigger you gotta put back in his place. So he slapped my great grandfather to teach him by degrees. Will answered him with a straight right hand and knocked evil to his knees. It was still Connecticut County back in 1925 and you couldn't whoop a white man if you wanted to stay alive. So Will got back on that wagon and he headed out for home. He didn't want Henrietta and the babies to meet the storm alone. But he did not pick his battles and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him and chariots on the wind. And those who stood with him were more than those who rode with him. Well, evil got his mob together and they passed around the cup. They say along about midnight, we'll go straight back up. And evil had the rifles, and evil had the rope, and Will had a shotgun, but he didn't have much hope. Then boss Mac Binion showed up with his pistol in his hand. He said, I heard y'all gonna try to lynch my hardest working man. Now I don't know who you worthless trash think you come to kill, but I'll gladly shoot the man who lays a hand on my man Will. And one by one they dropped their guns and went into the night. Will lived to see another day, he'd won a hopeless fight. In the word of God from World War I, it saved him once again. Cause he did not pick his battles and he never chose his friends. Will died in a nursing home at the age of 91. And standing at that funeral home is the one who wrote this song. And I tell this old man's story just to pass along that even when you're by yourself, you never stand alone. 
You can't always pick your battles or always choose your friends. When you get up in the morning, don't know how the day will end. But there are angels all around us and chariots on the wind. And he who stands with us is more than those who ride with him. Connected County, Alabama, 1925. Will Cunningham rode into town to get his week supplies. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, there is one particular wound that America is still dealing with. It is a wound that was caused by a war in Southeast Asia. And my friend, Joel Mabus, and all of the songs that had come out of the Vietnam conflict, my friend Joel Mabus, who lives here in Detroit, over on the western part of the state, wrote this song that I really love. And he commemorates the wall, you know, that monument that's in Washington, D.C., that has the names of all of the men and women who died in Vietnam. And it uh, goes something like this. I guess you'd call it our summer of freedom the year that we both turned 18. We hitchhiked to Denver, straight out of high school. Man, we were sights to be seen. And that was the summer you dated my cousin till he took us away in the fall. And I dearly wish you were standing here with me as I touch your name on the wall. Touch your name on the wall. Touch your name on the wall. God help us all to touch your name on the wall. Whenever I come here, I wear my fatigues to honor the men that I knew. And I touch the name of each man in my outfit, and I read them aloud when I do. Now some people say that they all died for nothing, but I can't rightly agree. Cause this brother here, he didn't die for no country. He died for me. Touch a name on the wall. Touch a name on the wall. God help us all to touch a name on the wall. Now walls are usually made to divide us, to separate me from you. But God bless the wall that brings us together and reminds us what we've been through. And God damn the liars and the tin-plated heroes who trade in the blood of these men. And God give us the strength to stand up and tell them Never can touch a name on the wall. Touch a name on the wall. God help us all to touch a name on the wall. Yeah. So Thank you so much. I, I, I think that the songs that heal us are the songs that don't take sides. I think the songs that heal us are the songs that see that folks were thinking, maybe in their own best interests, but not thinking about the other person. And when we start to put a name 
on situations and start to, to find things a little differently, coming away with a different point of view, then all of a sudden we discover that, again, we are more alike than we are different. So I wrote this song about four years ago, and I never thought that I'd need it again, <laughs> but here we go. There was that moment in 16 and 19 when 20 some Africans stepped on to the shore. And that was the start of America's dreaming, for they knew they'd see Angola no more. And there was that moment Jesus taught us of mercy, saying, What you do unto others you do unto me and he died on the cross to make all men holy and our fathers they died to make all men free and these are the moments that call us to action these are the moments we learn how to stand these are the moments we rise to the vision let us endeavor for greatness again And there were the moments when we welcomed the masses, the tired, the hungry, who yearned to breathe free. And they followed the dream like so many before them. And they followed the dreaming just like you and me. And there was the moment we cheered for Apollo, and the moment we wept when the challenger fell. United like men in the days of Pearl Harbor They left friends and family and marched in the hell For these are the moments that call us to action These are the moments we learn how to stand These are the moments we rise to the vision Let us endeavor for greatness again and there were dark moments when young boys like Emmett had lives cut short by the hate of the Klan. Will we really sit by over 60 years later and do nothing while it all happens again? And there are those moments when our children are slaughtered and we ask our leaders, can these weapons be banned? And they shrug back at us and self-righteous indifference saying we value the guns let the children be damned and these are the moments that call us to action these are the moments we learn how to stand these are the moments we rise to the vision let us endeavor for greatness again so as we did in the time of the COVID, though we wore masks, our spirits were seen. Let us endeavor to find our greatness. Let us fulfill America's dream. Let us fulfill America's dream. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the time is just about up, but there's one little thing that I discovered, just like I discovered that the same three chords and the same five notes that we dance to are the same chords that we march to.
Mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. He is trampling down the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He's loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. God's truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. God's truth is marching on. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the roll and Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on to victory. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles in the land and air and sea. First, we'll fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to wear the title of United States Marines. When the Union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. There is no power weaker than the feeble force of one, for the Union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome. Someday, oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Oh, beautiful for spacious sky. For amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesty up on the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much.